This is my jointer, and for what I do, I kind of classify this caliper of tool as good enough. I originally bought it, I want to say nine years ago, maybe eight years ago, with one task in mind. I was building 13 workbenches, and I needed to laminate up all those tops. The same style of workbench you see me using in all my videos. It has a really five, six inch thick top. This is a six inch jointer, less than four feet long. It served my needs. It got one edge flat enough so I could run it through a thickness planer to make them parallel. I could glue them up, had no problems whatsoever. Since that time, uh, I've kept it around and I use it for, you know, milling up stuff. And again, it's a good enough for what I do on it. The amount of use I've done on it, I want to say I've replaced the blade six or seven times. And most of those blades I would resharpen once or twice. A few of them I probably just swapped out just because I was being lazy. Uh, but, yeah, I'll tell you about what I've done on it. Now, I do not remember overly tuning this thing when I first got it, and I have not overly tuned it ever since. I'll adjust the levels up and down. I'll re-angle re, uh, this portion right here. But other than that, I've never really tuned my jointer. So since we just opened up the shop, moved this thing around, it got bounced around, and I even dropped it once, uh, I know it is all out of whack. So today I'm going to take the time to super tune my jointer. So I hope you'll come along and maybe you'll pick up a few tips for adjusting your other tools along the way. Now tuning and setting up tools is a whole other category. And obviously it's going to require slightly different tools, though a lot of the tools we use in our normal woodworking will translate. Besides, you know, sockets, screwdrivers, uh, wrenches, that kind of stuff, there are some specialty tools. Now, these are not things that I tell people to go get. It's one kind of the type of tools that I tell people, if you have the opportunity at a good deal, snap them up. Here's what I'm talking about. Uh, a few years ago, um, uh, woodpeckers, the, green, the red aluminum company makes a bunch of uh, measurement tools and stuff like that. Well, they were doing a, um, what do they call it, where they make it something with another brand's name for it, uh, for Woodcraft. And under that name, it was Black Aluminum with the Pinnacle name. And for something about their relationship uh, didn't work out, and Woodcraft stopped carrying the Pinnacle brand. So my local Woodcraft had a little tent sale where they were selling a bunch of stuff at a huge discount. And that's where I picked up you know, a carpenter square, and this square right here, which is back basically two triangles that I can either use bumping something else up here to register it, or I can unscrew it and I can have two separate triangles I can clamp stuff to or anything like that. I don't use this in my woodworking, but in tool setups and tool fences, going to my bandsaw, adjusting, readjusting it so it's square, stuff like that, this is invaluable because it's a tool I know will not change. I am very precious with this tool and this ruler right here. And I don't really use them in my woodworking very much. These are strictly for tool setups and it's a resource I like having. Can I do the same exact things with a simple piece of plywood that's cut to this angle? Yes, but I know that even plywood moves and gets adjustment and stuff like that and might change up. These are very precise tools that I happen to collect when the, they were available at a, uh, an attractive price and I keep them very pristine for tool setups. And one tool like that that I keep is a nice straight edge. This is the one I got. It's 24 inches long and really for all my cabinetry and stuff like that, if I'm going over, I'm looking make sure something is flat. I can use this as a winding stick. Uh, just knowing I have one really good metal straight edge that I can depend upon is a true luxury and I, I really do pamper this thing. What makes this ruler a straight edge is that one side has a flat and on this one it's actually hollowed out so it touches. There's a groove right here so you can be guaranteed it's going to sit flat on something. If there's any kind of dust or something like that in one little spot, 
it won't affect it that much. And now you can do stuff like to put finger gauges underneath it. It'll stay on your product so you can use it as a straight edge, not just a ruler. If this thing didn't have any measurements whatsoever, it would be as effective as setup tool as without it as with them. Uh, having the ruler is just a luxury. Now, because the brand Pinnacle isn't being made anymore, or I don't believe it's being made anymore. I, I haven't seen it in many, quite a few years. I did reach out to Woodpecker to see if they uh, wanted to showcase one of their current products. It's the same exact thing. They did happen to send me a uh, three-foot one instead of the two-foot one because I already had the two-foot one. But I, I just kind of wanted to demonstrate on something that customers could get currently. But know that I've been using this thing for a very long time. Uh, I'm also a cabinet box maker, and they had these little clamping corners uh, you use to square stuff up during gluing things. And this can serve the purpose of these setup triangles for a lot of the tools I use. Uh, plus, they had the added benefit of being used for woodworking later on. So they sent me a four of these uh, to demonstrate how they can be used for setting up the tools. So whether you want to call that sponsor or want, uh, weren't tools I really needed. I could get them accomplished, uh, but they were generous enough to send them out so I could demonstrate them to you. Now in this Super Tomb, I'm also going to play around with one of these angle finders. This one just happens to be a Wixie, but most of them seem to be working the same. Uh, I'm not 100% sure how to check this, but we'll see how accurate it is. And I'm going to need to depend upon some feeler gauges. You know, these are a standard set that you could buy at most auto places or uh, maybe even a big box store. I also have these no-name brand blade setters that sets the heights of your blade. This was a game changer for me for, set, uh, for quick adjustments and blade changes. You just have to set your tool up initially to work with them. But after that, great. We'll discuss these too. Now, a dedicated setup tool that I highly recommend is this from Grizzly. I want to say that they call this their president special because the owner of the company kind of decided that everybody that buys a tool from them, they really need to have some really fine setup blocks. So they might sell these at or below cost just to get them out in the hands of stuff. And what it includes is a little dial indicator, dial adjustment tool, you know, something to hold it onto a bar, and this magnet, and I will tell you, you've probably seen me using this magnet a lot uh, because I use it as a stop block on my table saw, and just there's just a bunch of uses for having a good solid magnet in your shop with a bar that you can attach stuff to. Uh, I use it on my lathe a lot to put a light there and stuff like that. This is just a really inexpensive kit that they offer that. I'd highly recommend. I will show you how to do things without this, but you also see why this is so beneficial uh, during the video. I also have some rust problems because I got rained on in the move and just being around the shop in, in that time frame it had to be stored outside for quite a bit of while. So I got some brass uh, wire sets, some little sanding pads, and then uh, I'll be using Johnson Pace Wax and WD-40 to kind of arrest any future rust developments. Other consumables I think I probably will use in the Super Tune is just some carb cleaner, some axle grease, some or synthetic grease. I use this for axles on motorcycles. And I'm going to try out this new WD-40. None of these are sponsored. Uh, I just thought I'd try them out. So the first thing I'm going to do, doesn't require a whole lot of explanation, so I'm going to go ahead and disassemble it uh, and clean up the different sections. Won't totally disassemble it, just the parts that are kind of obvious. Now I will tell you that this little guard right here, 
the spring broke within the first week of doing it. I remember that one when we were doing the thing. So there has never really been a spring working here. I just kind of manually move it back and forth. Not the safest thing in the world. Hopefully I can find a spring somewhere. Now you could tell I've sharpened these blades a couple of times because I basically only sharpen the tip. Yeah, it's increasing the angle a little bit, but I don't really care. It makes it a little bit more durable and a lot less work for me. And you can see my Sharpie marks on them, which I use to help set up the, the other stuff. So I'm hoping that's about all the disassembly I'm going to have to do. But there is a chance I'll have to remove these two wings. Uh, we'll find out later on when we adjust everything. But for now, I'm just going to uh, surface the tops, make them nice and shiny, and get rid of all the rust stuff, and make them slick. I want to do that one now before I do all the adjustments, because in case that changes anything. That involves spot sanding the really bad stuff, then using WD-40 as a lubricant, and sanding the entire setup cleaning that up and then using good old-fashioned Johnson paste wax to put a nice protective finish off of it, let it haze up, then buff it out. Now our normal jointers need to be aligned in several, I guess, planes you would say. We, you know, a jointer has, you know, the cutter head, then we have the in-feed and out feed table and normally the blade comes up a little bit there so this is a little bit lower now if for some reason the out feed table as it is at a slightly different angle like that right there your jointer will still cut but it will a lot of times it'll add tapers to your board and i know mine does that too does that in that if i plane multiple times over it you know, a parallel board will all of a sudden become a tapered board. So yes, we need to make sure that these two plant, these two sections are completely in line this way. Okay, but we also have to worry about twist. So if we have our cutter heads and that is in one plane, we actually have to make sure that our out feed and our in feed tables are in that same plane. They're all in line. And it is really kind of common that they aren't. Uh, sometimes your in feed will be at a slighter angle and the other times maybe your out feed will be at a different angle. So as you're moving the board over it, in order to line everything up and you're putting pressure down, you actually induced a fraction of a degree of twist in your board. So it's not as accurate as it can be. So the f one plane that we have to focus on is getting both of these boards absolutely in line with the cutter head. And then we hope that our cutter head will cause the in feed table and the out feed table to be parallel across the ways. Sometimes they aren't. One will be slightly out from the other, so you still have to work that all out. So we are just like in a board, we're not only worrying about straight boards, but we're also worried about the twist that this thing is supposed to be getting rid of, but it could actually induce. Now, as stated earlier, this is a six, six and a quarter jointer, and they call this a dovetail style jointer. And frankly, I'm of the strong opinion that most of these in this size, this length and stuff like that, probably come out of the same molds at some factory. And, you know, everyone puts their own paint, their own base on it, but... This section right here on almost all of them seems identical to me. And but what it is, is they have these 45 degrees. We have three main parts. And as you move these in and out, they slide up and down on those platforms to make them rise up and down. And these platforms are what keep it parallel to each other as they go up and down. You also have a section right here 
that the bearings for the the cutter head right on uh, and we can adjust those there too. Now the setup gets its dovetail name by how it attaches the, the bed to the base unit. Notice you have two dovetail slides right here. This one is actually all the way against metal and this one right here has a little bit of a gap. There's actually a bar inside that gap that you can actually loosen and tighten and that's how we can actually loosen the joint over here so this unit could rattle back this way but that's how we're able to get adjustments for parallelism this way and that way. Because if I loosen this up a little bit, I can raise either this side or this side and put a slight shim on that bed coming up. And then you tighten it back down and it locks it down. And you know, you put a thousandth of an inch shim on this side, it actually exaggerates out this direction so that you can adjust both that way and left and right. If you put equal number of shims on each side, it will lift this edge. If you put one more on this side than that side, it will change its direction. And you loosen that gib up with these screws on the side. And, and notice that both the in feed and out feed have that gib adjustment set up. They're almost identical. So you can adjust both the left side or the front and the back that way, that way and this way and that way. Now, I don't know if there's a traditional order of what to adjust what. My opinion is I'm just gonna start. And I'm gonna start by aligning the end field with the cutter head, making sure that they are both in the same plane. Now, my jointer has a wheel on this side that I can use to adjust it up and down. Some of them have a wheel right there. Some of them just have a little bar. Some of them have a real long bar so you don't have to reach underneath it. But my objective is I'm gonna use my short straight edge, short, long, I don't think it matters. But I want to line this up so it just is in line with one side of the cutter head. So I'm going to use my short two foot straight edge. You can use long one, short, whatever. Uh, and I like having the cover off because I can use my thumb on the belt as a little friction point to move it back and forth. And all I'm going to do is coming over to the very edge right here, I'm going to adjust it so that it doesn't move my ruler whenever it touches. So I'm raising it up until it moves it ever so slightly right there. Put it back. It moves it so I now need to go down. Now there's some slop in my wheel. You have to take into account that. A little farther down, a little farther down. And right there, it doesn't seem to be moving anymore. So I've got just perfect. Now if I come over on this side, it's not touching. So I do not know if that's too low and that was the high side, so I just lowered it down. So now I'm going to raise it up some and redo the entire setup on this side. We're so slightly touching now. I come over here, I do the same exact test again. Notice it's moving it. So this, we now know, is the low side. Another way we can test it is with our gauge. Basically, I've got my arm set up on the magnet. I can lock the magnet down or secure it pretty tightly. Uh, this one right here has kind of an adjustment. If you go a little bit, you can slightly move it around. And then, you know, basically you have your little feeler gauge down here that goes up and down. So if I set it to zero, twist this so it's sitting right at zero. Right there, as I move across something, it shouldn't change its thickness as much. That's how you can test to see if something's really flat. So obviously this is machined flat right there, so it's not registering. So if I were to come over here and put it right on the circle and go back and forth until I get the high spot and move this over. 
So right now is right at zero at its high spot. And then I come over to this side and see the high spot is a good quite a bit up. So, so that basically tells me that we are roughly six to seven thousandths uh, higher on that side than we are on this side. Now I can adjust that by either doing those, loosening up those gibs and putting um, some um, shims on this side to raise it up so it's equal to that. Or I have another option of putting a shim underneath the bearing right here. Meaning I want to slide a shim underneath the bearing that's holding the cutter head. Now I'm going to be using a tin can, an aluminum can, just because it's what I have and it's cheap. Uh, you can actually go get feeler gauges if you want to sacrifice them and put them in there so you can put exactly the right size on there. But here's a cool thing. If you're just putting a thin piece of that aluminum, if I put it on the very bottom, it's going to lift up the, the cutter head, the full thickness of that aluminum. But if I were to bring it over and place it over here on the side, well, it's pushing the cutter head this way. So part of the thickness of that aluminum is lifting it up and part of it is moving it over. I don't really mind if my cutter head goes this way or that way as long as it's parallel. That's just a microscopic skewing. So if I don't want to go the full thickness of that aluminum can, I can just slide in the shim over on this side. Oh, and FYI, an aluminum can is only you know, two to three thousandths of an inch. So to test our results, I could do the straight edge again and rotate it back and forth and test it on both sides to figure out which was the high side. Or I could use my feeler gauge and I've got it set so, you know, it's right at zero roughly at the top dead center. So if I come over here and it's at zero and I come over here and it's actually, you know, a thousandths or two above zero, well, we cut our error down by... 80% two-thirds I'm happy with that so we now have this bed and my cutting head completely level now I am going to say that this is now the standard and I'm not going to touch the infeed side I just want to make the outfeed side parallel with the infeed side and real quickly I'm going to test it now I'm not going to waste time resetting zero if it's the same measurement on both sides I'll be happy so right now it goes up to looks like 42 and a half on this side and 52 and a half on that side. So these two do have a twist that I need to take into account. But before I take that into account, being this the high side, so I know I need to raise this side up a little bit, I want to check to see if they are parallel. I mean, this way. Maybe I can uh, kill two birds with one stone. To do that, I'm actually going to raise the infeed table above the cutting head so it won't touch. And I'll probably have to lower the outfeed table. And then I'm going to use a straight edge. And this is where having a longer straight edge works out. Uh, I've heard a general rule that you want, a, want it to be at least three-fourths the lengths of your total side. Me personally, I did okay with my 24 inch on this size caliper, I believe. But right now, I'm just going to eyeball it so that both of those two sides, I don't see any light coming through. And I can obviously see... 
they are nowhere close to being in plane. So making the in-feed side our default, you can tell even without the feeler gauges with by the way of the light that I have quite a bit of adjustment that I need to make on the outfeed side. And the th I'm going to be doing that by putting shims along this side of the board, uh, of the slides and on that side. I'll just put more on this side to take care of the twist and uh, more on the bottom than the top to take care of the lift. But notice, the farther out you go, the more the gap is exaggerated. So just a little bit of a, uh, shims here will make a pretty big difference over here because it is amplified. So first things first, let's go ahead and loosen up the gibbs so that we can uh, move this and slide those shims in. And on my jointer, that's going to be involve uh, loosening up these three hex, these three nuts, so that I can get to the hex screws that lock the gib in. So right now, you can see the bed itself is tight. I can't really move it. So I come over here and just break these loose. Then loosen up these hex screws. I'm just going to loosen them all the way up. I'm totally resetting everything, so I'm not worried about it. And you can see that this doesn't take too long. Now, these hex screws are kind of what will set it after the fact, after you do all your adjustments, so it won't go out of adjustment. You don't want to get them too tight when you redo it, because you do want this thing to slide. But mine also has this manual one with a little lever. So right now, if I'm making adjustments, it's not going to move anything. So I can come over here and use this manual one to loosen it up, to make add my shims, then retighten it up, test everything, get it the way I want, and when it's all set, I come back and do all these locks things. But right now, you can see it's loose, loose enough that I should be able to get shims in underneath there to make my adjustments. Now, I am sure that there is some kind of math that will tell us exactly how much shims you can do for a certain distance. I'm just kind of eyeballing it. My thinking is I want to raise this side up, so I'm going to put two shims on the top and bottom to lift this side up more than this side. I'm then going to add two more shims for a total of four down on bottom right here and two on this side so that the back will have two extra aluminum cam spacers to lift this side up and uh, this side will have two lifting this side up. And hopefully that'll work. Let's test it out. I can make two by just folding these over for either side. If I put these two inside this one, that'll give me four. So I have two on top, four on bottom, and two on bottom over there. So on the back side, which is only going to get two on the bottom, I just kind of lift up the gib, maybe loosen it up a little bit more, and slide that in there, just like that. Then on this side, I'm going to slide two in on top, and hopefully four in on bottom. Okay, so now after all that is done, I'll come back over and I'm just going to tighten this piece, the temporary one, the hand adjustment one, to recheck all my measurements to see how close I got. And you can see it really tightened it down. So once again, I grab my straight edge. Understand this is change. So I'm going to lower it down so that I can register against the front side. I've got air gaps. So I'm going to raise it up so it touches right there or right there first. You've got to keep an eye out on it because if I've raised it up too, too high, it's going to touch on that side first. And I think we're still going to be a little bit off on the tail side, but let's see. Yep, 
Whoa. I might have gotten lucky. Okay, we have 0 0.005. I cannot slide it in front. I can't slide it in back. So all the way at the very back over here, it will just barely touch in with a little friction. Using tin cans or aluminum cans, I think that's as good as I'm going to get. Got lucky on this one. So now that that is set, I can come back on the back side and re-tighten up all those give uh, hex keys and lock washers. And once again, when you tighten these, tighten them up and then back off a little bit. You want them snug enough so that it doesn't move, and, but loose enough that it will slide easily. And really, you probably ought to lube these uh, channels right now, but really, I kind of set mine to a certain step uh, and, and just leave it there because I'm using it to flatten, and uh, I can now use it to square up. But I'm not ever really worried about taking off you know, more than a sixteenth at a time. I just set it and forget it. So back off your temporary loosening and then give it a good shake. Make sure it doesn't move and then you can adjust it up and down to see that it slides. Retest it and you're all set. Tighten that up barely. Now after all reassembly, we have our uh, in feed and out feed, so I want, now want to test that twist action. And what I'm noticing is now this is the low side, this is the high side, by about a tenth. Uh, well, or wait a second, by about a hundredth. So if I, that's pretty close to, for my taste, uh, if I wanted to fix that anymore, what I probably could do is take out one aluminum uh, can link. So I have one here and three back there. Now, one thing I might try is let's try compressing that aluminum a little bit by just giving it a few, few whacks. And now it's about half of that change. I'm going to be happy with that. Next up, I'm going to attach the fence runner on these two slots, making sure that it's also parallel here which if it's not would involve putting a shim up top or down below to kick it out one way or the other. Now we turn our attention to our fence and I'm just going to roughly sand off the bottom just very lightly to remove any rust and just make it slide easier. Rub a little paste wax in and you can see the mill marks are still there so it'll kind of hold the wax in there and just kind of continue to lubricate over time. Then slide it on, making sure you get the nut in the right orientation. This particular one has these two little wings right here so that it won't rotate within here. So my locking screw will lock it down. Now 
Now, I'm sure every fence is different. Me, personally, I, I don't think I've ever used this thing out of 90 degrees. So I just set mine to 90 degrees, loosen that up so it can rotate, set it down. And then this particular one has a little flip lever that I can actually adjust it so whenever it sits on that one, it's a perfect 90 degrees. So if I do go out at any time, I can always reset it. I don't really trust it. I just get to 90 degrees and lock it down, and then you can set all the other adjustments so it locks it square. But one of the cool things now is I always have a problem with checking square. Didn't realize how far out of twist these two beds are. So I ended up only doing square on the front and never worrying about the back. Because if you check your square here and here, well, it always led me to believe that this might be twisted. But it turned out my bed was twisted. And that's where the setup blocks like these corner cabinets from Woodpecker come in really great. Because they are machined square, so I can come over here and just get it to touch on both sides. I know it will square, and that will stay sitting up straight. Whereas my old triangle, I would actually have to hold it at the same time because it doesn't want to stay up straight. And if you know anything about geometry, when you're using a triangle like this, you actually have to get it squared this way and this way in order for that angle to be true. Because if I have it out of square and it's leaning, you can see I can make the square square where it's fitting everywhere, but it ain't because you can see the gap right there. Whereas these being square in all those directions, plus right here, if I bump it up into the face, I can find it square this way, and it's just going to sit on that square. So I know that square is going to read square. Now, if you do have one of these uh, stops, you can actually use it as a micro adjuster. Just loop back off your lock uh, nut, and then you can twist it. And what I will do is I will loosen it up and then rotate the the fence all the way back so that the gap is up top on my square like that and then you can tighten into alignment using the stop now the problem with the the setup is my particular one I lock it with this screw right here and sometimes that will throw it up. So what you end up having to do is get the appropriate amount of gap so that as you lock it, it will come in to square. So I slowly bring it into square. And if I lock it, it slightly goes out and then Lock your lock nut. You now have a perfect 90 degrees in front. And within a hundredth over six inches of 90 degrees in back. Good enough for woodworking. Another way to check it would be to use your digital thing. You know, square yourself up and zero it out. Then tenth there. Within the tenth, I'm happy with that. So there we go. The jointer itself is now super tuned. And remember those digital readouts, they round up. So it could be 0 .006 or it could be 0 .14. It would still read that 0 .01. Uh, or 0 0.014. Well, you get the idea. Uh, the only thing left is sharpening the blades and installing them and getting them aligned up. Now, I'm going to leave the sharpening up to you to learn, so it could be just like you're putting in new blades this next step. Now, installing the setting the blades is made so much easier with these cheap little gizmos. And I was reading on the back of them, it's kind of indebted. They call them the Mini Planer Pal. I actually originally got these.
for a you know a 90s era thickness planer, planer I bought used and it didn't come with the tool to set the blade so this was just kind of an aftermarket solution and what they are is you have four magnets to hold it to the drum you had this little pin right here that registers it against the drum and then you have one magnet to hold the blade so the pin actually goes to the front part now you might have to lower the infeed side to make this work uh, so you have access so I push it forward until it stops right there and it can't go any farther forward now I know where the, the magnet for the blade is going to be now my drum has these two screws right here which I can use to raise and lower the blade in normal circumstances and that will allow you to get a lot of life out of a set of blades. I'm being lazy right now just replacing them instead of resharpening them, them this time. Um, so you can, as you resharpen it and wears away, you can just raise it up. But this time I'm going to actually lower it all the way down and I will use that at the end to kind of anchor it. So I'm going to drop this, these little, oh I forget what these bars are called, but they lock the blade in, bl blade lock, whatever. You want to make sure you get it the right way, which means that it has the little U on the top, and that kind of helps with clearing out chips. So I drop that in there. Then I'm going to drop the blade in. Now there's some uh, different opinions on where to place the blades because this is a six and a quarter inch jointer, and the blade is actually a little bit longer than the drum. So you can actually move it back and uh, install it either a little bit too far this way or a little bit too far that way. And one school of thought is if you move, mount all your blades all the way over, if you ever get a little nick in one portion of the blade, which means you're going to get a nick all, in all three blades, well then you can move this one over ever so slightly. So two of the blades will have the nick in that spot and this one will, will remove the wood where that nick is. And then if you get another neck, you can move it over. If you mount it right in the center, you have the option of moving over this way a little bit and that way a little bit. So you can move each blade twice to remove necks. So basically handle six necks in between sharpenings. Uh, so just kind of different ways you can think about it. I'm more the opinion of putting it right in the middle. So I'm now going to drop the blade in there, making sure it is very, very loose. You don't want any kind of leeway there and then using my little gizmos drop it in notice that the blade just popped up to it and then I'm going to move it forward until it hits touches the top and that way I know both sides will be at the, at the exact same height because both of these gizmos are the same and then move it forward until that little pin touches and that has set the height of my blade. So now I just tighten up the out two outsides of this little blade holder thing, Bob, which I don't remember what you call. And when you got the two outsides snug, you can remove your magnets. Your blade is set. So then you just tighten up the two middle ones. Now, you know, if you're a machinist, you're probably screaming at me because generally, like, cylinder heads and stuff like that, you always tighten the middles and you work your way out, but, hey, this works. When you got all four tightened up, that's when I'll go back in and I will readjust the screws up because it's locked in. So, basically, I just raise the screws up until it kind of bumps into the blade and it'll be okay. And you can kind of check the registry because if you look at the gap on the blade against the drum right there, you can see it's very, very even all the way across. So do that same thing to all three blades and you're going to be all set. Now, if you don't have those little gizmos, you can set your blade height the very traditional way. All you really need is a straight edge. And what you do is you put the blade in at just any kind of random setting. Get it kind of like somewhat even. And then I will pick one side or the other. It doesn't really matter. You're going to assume this blade is not level all the way across. And what I would do is I would come over here. 
I will move the straight edge over and I will rotate the blade. See how it just ever so slightly touches the straight edge? I had to, I raised the bed to that point. So I moved the bed, I lined the bed to that spot on the blade. So now I can basically somewhat snug this side up a little bit, not too tight, and come over and do the same exact thing to the other side of the blade. See how this one, touching it ever so slowly, it's moving it. That is just a tad bit too high in comparison to what it was doing to the straight edge on this side. Actually, they're pretty good. So what I would do now is come over here and I'm going to, using the screw, I'm going to screw the screw in to lower the, the, the blade. So I basically... Put it in, one half turn, and then I'm going to press down on the blade, and that lowered the blade. So now when I come over here, and I rotate it, not touching at all. And then working my weight, bringing it back up, you know, a quarter of a turn at a time at the most, I will come over here and raise it up until it ever so slightly kisses my straight edge right there. Probably back it off a sixteenth of a turn. And then I can tighten up this little locking thing that locks a blade all the way across. So I basically, to repeat, I set the blade in here, I readjusted the outfee table to that point on the blade. And then I reset the height of the other side of the blade to the outfeed table. And then for the rest of the other three blades, I just set them all to the outfeed table doing that little feel thing with my straight edge. Now once you do one or two of these, it doesn't, it goes pretty fast. You know, you come over here, you lower the set screws down, you screw in the anchor points so that there's a lot of play. You drop that in, you somewhat center it. You drop in your blade so it rests on those screw things right there. You tighten up a couple of the nuts on this bar just so they're snug. They don't have to be tight, just snug enough so that there's a little friction as you move the blade and it's not going to move anywhere after the fact. So here we go. I come back over. I'm going to drop the millimeter into the little hex key, the razor, put my straight edge, whoops, put my straight edge down and then begin rotating the blade and, and raising up that screw until it just kisses the ruler. Right there. Tighten this outside one up a little bit more to snug that one down. Repeat the process on this side. See right there, I'm moving it. So go back it off a little bit. Loosen this screw up, this nut up a little bit so I can press the blade down. Re-snug it up just a little. There it goes. So now that those are touching, just retighten it up. So that was roughly two minutes per blade. So within 10 minutes, you could not only put in new blades, but set them, even if you don't have the little gizmo. I still need to get a spring for this. So here we go, let's test it out.
again, I, I typically set mine to take, you know, a 16 to 30 second light pass, and I just take multiple passes. Uh, I might have the slightest of scalloping, but the real test, there is no light. It's flat. Is there a pivot point? Right in the middle. Right in the middle. So it's just pivoting around the center. So there we go. A nice tuned jointer. Well, I hope you all got a little tips out of that one. Even if you're not restoring or redoing a jointer you picked up off Craigslist or redoing something you've had for a little while, like I did right here, there are some tips and techniques in there that you might have learned off of. And I'm going to be doing the same exact thing, except on my table saw in the next video. So if you want to learn how to super tune your table saw, you'll come, have to come back, at, back in a few days. But before then, I want you to remember that it's always worth the effort to learn, create, and share with y'all. Be safe and have fun.